confused about that. <laughs> we have that effect on systems, do we? Yeah, it <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning all. Um, here we are, the uh, South Yorkshire audit. Uh, I think before we start, we'll do a quick round of introduction for our few new faces. So we'll start with me. I'm the chair and I'm the councillor for loss. Um, Hi, uh, Gareth Sutton, Exec Director of Finance and Investment. David Phillips, Independent Member of the Audit Committee. Mike Thomas, the Assistant Director of Finance here at SYMCA. Hi, Lisa McKenzie, I'm the Internal Audit Manager with Grant Thornton. Hi, I'm Sarah, I'm Democratic Services Officer, I'm in a thing meeting. At the uh, screech. There we are. Um, Martin, um, good morning everyone. I'm Martin, Martin Swales, Chief Exec, MCA. Good to see you. Tim Taylor, Director of Public Transport. Liz Morris, covering risk management. Uh, Ruth Adams, Deputy Chief Exec of the South Yorkshire MCA. Councillor Mike Reeve, Rich Sheffield City Council. Councillor Austin White representing Doncaster Council. Uh, Rhys Jarvis, Vice Chair of the Committee and Independent Member. And on screen. Yeah, so to be fair to Clerks and myself, so apologies getting quite dizzy there with the camera angles changing going around the, <laughs> going around the room. So I'm, I'm Peter Clark. I am the Internal Audit Director for Grant Thornton. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have uh, a couple of announcements I suppose they are. Welcome first of all to, to David Phillips, our new member and regrettably Ruth is leaving us. This is Ruth's last meeting. Ruth's been here since uh, the start of the game um, and I'm sure we'll all be very sorry to lose you and we hope we get someone. We hope we get someone as good. Well, I hope we get someone. <laughs> So, yeah, but you were last meeting. Congratulations on your freedom, okay. impending freedom. <laughs> Does anybody else want to say anything on that matter? No? Okay. Right, so items considered in the absence of public and press. I don't think there are any. Declarations of interest by members, pecuniary and non pecuniary. None. Reports from and questions by members. Again, none, thank you. Minutes of the previous meeting and actions. Meeting on the 14th of July. First of all, are they correct record? Also on that? I have a, I have a, a question regarding uh, point 62, I think it is. I'm not sure it reads correctly, so I don't know whether you want to report it as, as, as correct. Because it says that democratic services to edit the minutes to reflect that Councillor Auckland was present and that following his nomination to be chair, it was the chair who welcomed everybody to the meeting and not Councillor Auckland. I suggest that we put your name in and following your nomination to be chair, it was the chair who welcomed. Otherwise, it's a bit confusing. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, so instead of the two, yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. points on the action log. Okay. 
Um, so there were some concerns raised um, by the chair on behalf of the committee, as well as myself, um, about a, a number of areas where we felt that um, communications uh, between external audits and the committee could be improved. Um, so for instance, um, the attendance, uh, presentation of reports, um, and also giving a clear idea on the, the audit plan and also any advance notice on fee scale variations, which I know has been a long running saga and uh, a cause of um, frustration for members of the committee in the past. Um, so from the meeting, we received various commitments from um, Hassan, the, the partner at EY. Um, he's committed to ensuring that either he or his deputy uh, will ensure they're present at every audit committee meeting, which was a, a key uh, request of this committee. And he, hopefully he'll be joining us very shortly. Um, he also, ah, there he is, fantastic. And secondly, um, he agreed to ensure that for this meeting there will be an audit plan um, for the 21-22 audit, which the committee could review and comment on. And Hassan has delivered on that one as well. Um, I think those are the main things that I recollect, Chair, and feel free to chip in if I've missed anything obvious. Hassan, I hope you can hear us. Uh, good morning. Um, I can. Uh, apologies for uh, being late. Didn't uh, just realise I didn't have an invita uh, invitation with a Teams link on it. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, right. Are there any other? I've, I've, I've got one. Um, we've we've got a point on the minutes which say that uh, at every meeting we would bring forward. Um, an update on the government improve, governance improvement plan, and I don't believe it's on the agenda. No, it's not. What, what uh, Claire's done is the strengthening corporate governance is the update of the stock take of all of the audit things that we're doing um, to, to update members on that, and, and the, the governance improvement plan is one of those, but, but, but at this point she, she did that report this time, so yes, yeah, she did apologise that... The strengthening governance improvement is trying to sort of set all of the things that we're doing to improve, uh, and then the governance improvement plan will come back next time. It doesn't help to print the report either. Yeah. Well, I know I know it's at the back end where it's it's supposedly there for every meeting, but that's yeah. that, that's a key one we should be looking at. Yeah, it is, yeah. on that. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, transport risk working group update. Chris? Yes, I'll put my microphone on. Um, we duly met two days ago. Um, we had a full complement. So we had uh, Councillor White was there with me as, as well as Councillor Auckland. And we were pleased to have Liz back. So wel welcome, Liz. It's good to have you back into the fold and Tim was with us as well. Um, we didn't have uh, a terms of reference as such. We actually didn't have anyone to take minutes, but I think our purpose was, was, was perfectly clear, which was to review the transport risks, to gain oversight in terms of how those risks are being handled um, and get some assurance, and we also offered some challenge. Um, so I'm basically reporting back in that format. Uh, as we didn't have a set agenda, um, my suggestion was that we just utilised the transport risks that were presented to us, which we had five sheets of paper, um, and in keeping with best practice, we looked at the health and safety risks first, of which there is one red risk, which appears to have been going on for a long time, um, which relates to uh, an intersection between the road and the uh, tram system at Barnard Road, where we have uh, a lot of potential red flags with regard to possible accident. Um, 
there's a lot of near misses that we've had and it seems to be a difficult problem to get this resolved. So I mean, Tim can comment if he likes, um, but this was the first real health and safety risk that we grasped. Oh yeah, just briefly on that uh, particular risk, Chair. So um, it is, as you say, Burners Road Junction near to the tram depot. Um, there's an ongoing piece of work with Sheffield City Council to look at uh, signal improvements. There's been some changes made to vegetation uh, at the junction since the collision last year. Um, uh, and we're awaiting the outcome of using the data from the traffic survey to model on whether or not we can make changes to signaling and everything else to further improve safety. So that's probably all the traffic reports at this point in time. Thank you. There were, there were two other health and safety risks that we, we looked at. These relate to the overhead gantries and the weights on the overhead gantries for the tram system, which um, there is some mitigation in the way that this is looked at. Um, and also with regard to um, what they call stray currents, which requires a good earthing on the rails, which can cause to rail degradation. Um, <coughs> we then looked principally at the red risks, of which there were nine. One I've already mentioned. The other eight, I basically categorized them into into five categories. Um, I'll start with the first one, which I call bus service continuity. So this is a very high high risk for the MCA. It relates to both funding, the operation, the viability, and indeed the engagement um, of the bus service. Um, we're, f we're finding that uh, the patronage on, on the bus routes is running at about 80% pre-COVID. Um, so the viability is, is very much in, in question. Um, the operators themselves are, are not, I think, keen to continue in this vein, and they're losing money. Um, so obviously some decisions are going to have to be made in terms of what happens with the bus service. There are uh, possibilities that are being looked at in the mitigation, and I know there's a paper being put forward at the moment, and that relates to whether we engage, continue to engage in a partnership arrangement um, or we actually look at franchising. Franchising means high risks because you basically take um, very much of the work in-house. It includes the depots, it may include the buses, but you are in control. When you have a partnering arrangement, you're not in control uh, because it's up to the bus operators to define the routes and everything else. So decisions will have to be made on that. But as I say, there is a paper being put forward. Um, the second one relates to trams, and it's very much in the same vein. The difference here is that there is now a decision to bring the tram service in-house. Um, that will flag up different risks. It will flag up operational risks in the sense that those will be run by the MCA, not externally by Stagecoach. Um, there is clearly, when you go through the operation of bringing it in-house, there are potential chupi risks relate to the fact that you will bring that those staff members on board um, and you've got the the continuity that, that goes with the maintenance because the maintenance regime may well still reside with stagecoach in terms of their ipr and uh, the mca will have to learn that maintenance regime um, there is also the risks that go with that in regard to the age of the trams uh, because there's a looking at the point at which there will be, need to be renewal and the cost of that, whether you go for new trams or whether you actually look at, at having them refurbished. So that's, that was the second set of red, red risks. Um, the third one was to do really with the, uh, the, the, what I call the bus patronage and route delivery, some of which I've already mentioned. Um, <coughs> so I won't go that into that in any more detail. Um, and that finally, I will talk about project delivery because on the projects that we have at the moment, we have a high level of delay. Um, and the question is whether those will be done in time and it's likely they won't. There's possible cost es escalation because of the delays. And there's also the potential for clawback if we don't get those done in time. So my final point is the lower level risk. There were some which did not proceed to have actions for mitigation, which I don't think is the case uh, because we wanted to focus on any risk that didn't have mitigation, but I believe those will be put in for next time. So that, that concludes it. If I missed anything, Liz. Thank you. Hi.
questions and points for us on that report. Okay, thank you very much for that, Rhys. Moving on. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, okay. So moving on to item 10, terms of reference review. Are there any? Yes, there are. I'm, I'm, I'm just simply. Oh, right. okay. Sorry, we're getting a bit of feedback, which is why I stopped talking. Just got three very minor points on it, having had a read through. Um, more for people to note and just think about than, than respond with an answer now. Uh, under paragraph 3.2, we talk about considering the external auditor's annual audit and inspection letter. Normally, unless things have changed, we get a, a nicer 260 report, a report to those charged with governance as well. And I wondered if we wanted to include that in, in para 3.2. 3.4 says to consider and advise the authority on the findings of the review of the effectiveness of internal audit. I wonder whether we just needed to say which review of effectiveness of internal audit. Is that the sort of five yearly um, external review that internal audit service is meant to have? Is that a more frequent annual one, if we could just be a bit more specific there, it might be helpful. Um, and 3.7 says to oversee and review the authority's internal audit strategy and receive reports as appropriate. Just felt a bit brief to cover all of internal audit. I wonder if it wanted to make specific mention of uh, you know, the internal audit annual report and head of internal audit overall opinion on, on uh, the state of, of in, internal controls and things. So. Just three minor ones, I thought we could just flesh the terms of reference out with slightly. I, I, I had a, a question as well. I mean, should we in theory put in here the minimum uh, numbers of reports or, or stars of reports that are going to be given to the committee? I've seen that in terms of reference before, so at least we know that they are going to be uh, there. So these are, these are the key ones that we might want. Um, and the other thing is, do we have a mention in here the fact that the chair needs to put in an annual report? Should that also be included? I, I, it may be up, but I, I, I thought I missed it, so if it is in, that's fine. I mean, it, it, it's just done. I know it's done, but I, I just, just think for clarity, if you want to have a comprehensive terms of reference. Oh, it if it isn't, then it should be. Yeah. Yeah, I think we would accept all those points, so we'll, we'll make some adjustments. Thank you. I think the only point I want to make is that since we since we've slightly changed the terms of reference, uh, we have been consistently for it, which is very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Chair, I just uh, yes. had my uh, yes. virtual yes. hand up to to make a Sorry, make a point. Just on on three point uh, on three point two, I think it's uh, correct to say that we um, maybe the committee should reference our ISA two hundred and sixty, which is the audit results report, but also to say the reference to external auditors annual audit and inspection letter is. Um, is incorrect, so that's kind of old terminology. So what we have now uh, in terms of our uh, reporting responsibilities is to present an uh, auditor's annual report. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hassan. I'm sorry I didn't see you there. Um, that's OK. We, we were talking briefly before the meeting about the difficulty of <laughs> seeing everybody at the same time. Thank you. Uh, so, on to item 11, procurement and fees. Gareth. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a report in the pack today accompanied by a set of correspondence from the uh, the PSAA. Um, the committee would probably recall that the there was a recommendation to the MCA to um, enter into <coughs> arrangements with the uh, public sector audit appointment body um, for the source of our external audit. The correspondence in the pack today uh, details four things that I, I think are important. The first is that there is um, an expectation now that scale fees 
will rise. Scale fees are the, the, the price at which the audit service is delivered under the current contracts. And there is um, there's an expectation now in front of the PSAA, subject to consultation, that the cost will rise by £3,000 for the current audits for both City and the MCA. So it's the view of officers that that is not unreasonable given the, the weight of work that has been undertaken on pensions and something which the committee will be familiar with from previous audits. The second point is that the re-procurement exercise undertaken by PSAA for those audits um, commencing from financial year 23-24 has now been completed. And the third point is that the costs associated with those audits are now likely to be significantly in excess of those um, being, um, being incurred now. So PSAA suggests that they, the audit price will go up by around 150%. So for the group, that, re, um, that comes to about £90,000 per annum. So that is a significant strain on our budgets and this will ripple across um, the local authority sector um, and will be particularly hard felt by those authorities who are already incurring significant um, financial pressures associated with inflation and demand pressures. So PSAA note that they'll be taking this up with government with a recommendation that government provides some support to the sector, but that support is by no means um, guaranteed at this stage. The final point that is not within the pack and is relatively new news for us is the PSAA have, um, have written to us to indicate that subject to um, the, the usual processes uh, that they intend to appoint KPMG as the, um, as the MCA's auditor for financial year 23-24 onwards. So I'm happy to take any questions on that. on the 150% the increase, is that one and a half times or two and a half times the, the, the current fee? And I suppose linked to that, as CIT and MCA merge, will that provide opportunity for some downward pressure on figures the other way around? So two and a half times the uh, current rate. So it's a really significant increase, which just re reflects pressures within the audit system generally. There is potential um, for the for the fee, um, fee scales to come down, so an efficiency arising from having one set of books to audit rather than two. Um, but that's a conversation that we'll have to have with, with the external auditors at that point. Can I, can I, can I ask a question, John? So, Gareth, I mean, that's uh, that's well ahead of inflation <laughs> at that figure. But does that not, is that 90,000 what I would call all-inclusive? Or is that the baseline for then adding additional elements on that we've been seeing over the last two or three years? <laughs> One would hope it is an all-inclusive baseline that doesn't move over the next five years. Um, but obviously this is subject to, to change into the future. Some of the pressures that have arisen in the, the current financial year, I'm sure Hassan will say, is changes to audit regulations, um, which probably weren't forecast at, at the point of letting the original contracts. Some of them relate to inflationary pressures that we probably couldn't forecast at the start of the uh, original contracts, but we sincerely hope that that price doesn't move as it represents a significant increase on that which we're already paying. Yeah, so the 150% the, the is, uh, is the nationwide increase. So it's, um, it'll be felt by every authority across the country. Further points? No. Okay, that's accepted. Thank you for that. Um, external audit plan update, Hassan. This is your spot. Thank you, uh, Chair. So we've got uh, two um, reports uh, on the agenda. So a report for our audit of the uh, combined authority and also for the uh, passenger transport uh, 
executive. So if I take you, I'll just briefly take you through the um, two reports and happy to take any uh, questions after, after that. So uh, looking at our plan for the combined authority, uh, first of all, um, so that's starting on your page uh, 40. Uh, four of the or 43 of the uh, pack um, so I'll take you to uh, section one your page 45 of the uh, pack um, on that page it outlines our check um, our overall uh, audit strategy in terms of uh, areas of uh, significant risk or areas of focus and what we've all, what we've done there on that page is to summarize if there's been a change in our uh, uh, risk assessment or or not so the uh, green color doesn't mean it's all uh, everything's okay it just means there hasn't been a change in risk focus um, so we highlight there in terms of uh, you know, the fraud risks which are presumed by international standards on auditing in, in relation to revenue rec revenue and expenditure recognition uh, misstatements due to fraud uh, we've also got an area of focus there in relation to uh, pensions liability valuation and the valuation of property plant and equipment uh, we've got a change in our risk assessment in respect of IFRS 16 so that's been uh, downgraded effectively because the um, implementation date has been uh, further further delayed and we have uh, also there a then highlight the risk in relation respect of uh, procedures which we need to undertake in relation to assessing going concern and also accounting for uh, COVID grants. Also in section one, page 46, we summarise the materiality levels that we'll be using to undertake the audit. And then the within the executive summary also then outlines our audit scope, including responsibilities that we have for um, undertaking our value for money um, um, audit responsibilities and we highlight there a change of uh, member of the team so Sue Gill is uh, the engagement manager for the audit term this year. Section two of the report provides uh, further details in re relation to the uh, risk and areas of focus that were summarised um, within the executive uh, summary providing an outline of what the risks is and the procedures that we'll be undertaking to address the, the risks. Within section three, we focus on our value for money uh, responsibilities, uh, including the um, procedures that we undertake in terms of uh, identifying whether there's a risk of a significant weakness in arrangements and our responsibilities are limited to assessing the arrangements that the uh, authority has in place rather than necessarily reporting on uh, outcomes uh, in in respect of our 21-22 value for money planning we've completed our initial uh, planning uh, risk assessment procedures we highlight within the uh, plan on your page uh, 57 the areas that we've uh, looked at in coming to in undertaking our risk assessment at this stage we haven't identified any uh, risk of significant weakness in arrangements which would require us to undertake uh, additional work in terms of uh, you know further additional reviews within a particular uh, particular area in section four, page uh, 59 of the uh, pack, we um, provide further details on the materiality levels that we use, including the, uh, diff the reporting uh, audit difference threshold that we'll, where we will report differences uh, back to the committee um, and the, um, how, those, uh, how those materiality levels are, um, are calculated. Uh, we do request that the uh, committee uh, confirms its understanding and agreement uh, to the materiality levels that we'll be using to undertake our audit. Section five of the report provides further information in relation to the scope of our or of our audit, including uh, the um, the scope for undertaking the uh, the, the group audit. And then within section six of the report, we outline um, the um, our wider audit team involvement, which uh, includes uh, the 
potential use of our internal experts for undertaking work on uh, property valuations and the pensions uh, valuations. Within section seven, we uh, provide a summary of the uh, timeline. Within section eight, we confirm our independence. There are no issues that we're aware of which we need to report to yourselves as a committee. And then within the appendices, we uh, provide a summary of the uh, the fees. So we highlight there the um, scale fee, which has uh, already been uh, referred to. Um, we do reference within there, uh, which is um, common to what we have done in uh, the, the previous year, our assessment of what the um, fee should be in relation to um, the scale fee. So in our view, the scale fees are not adequate to undertake an audit in line with our auditor responsibilities. And um, we highlight there our view of what the uh, fee should be um, for undertaking the both the 20, well, undertaking 21-22 audit. We also provide a summary of what we've previously reported for the 2021 audit. Um, any amendments to the um, scale fee uh, require PSA approval um, for just for information for the prior year, management did not agree with the variations uh, which we were proposing and, and they have been submitted to PSA for determination. Similarly, if we're in a position for the 21-22 audit where, um, where we outlined that additional fees are required, but if management don't agree, then again, that will be submitted to the PSA for determination. Um, before I move on to the PTE uh, audit plan, I'll just pause there in case there are any questions on the uh, combined authority plan. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Hassan. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming I'm right in thinking that um, page 75 of our pack page 35 of your plan is the, the pricing for quality is extra amount you you feel you need to do, to to do to do the audit figure, and similarly for the PT on on theirs, um, yeah, just slightly irksome that um, you all bid for a, a fee at one level and then can't do the audits for less than basically twice twice that. But we are where we are, and as we say, we're now going up to going up to two and a half times next time. So probably a comment rather than a question. And, and slightly more positively, the performance materiality at 75% uh, feels like a, a good result to me for, for um, MCA. From from memory, that can be anything between 50 and 75%, and that the lower the figure means you test more, the higher the figure means you test less. So you tend to have a higher performance materiality, meaning that you, you think the risks are lower and the, the previous year's accounts are, are better. Am I reading that correctly? And would you like to expand a little bit on the performance materiality, please? Uh, correct. In terms of uh, setting the performance materiality, we do have a range of between 50 and 75 uh, percent, which we uh, which we apply. Um, and uh, given our assessment of uh, risks and the likelihood of material error with for um, combined authority, we're using a, a performance materiality of 75 percent. Um, and then that also uh, is um, the the other uh, figure to bear in mind there as well as the uh, the well the the, the performance but yeah because the performance materiality drives our um our testing threshold in terms of uh, the sample sizes etc that we do select so it does have it does have a bearing on the uh, on the amount of uh, amount of work that we that we undertake so you've presumably been happy that you've only need, you, you've not needed to test quite as as much based on the, the results of previous year's audit set yeah, correct. I, 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 have a, I, have, I have a question, Chair. It's really for Gareth. So we've now moved the, uh, the audit six months against our normal plan, which is to have it by the end of July. Now we're talking the end of January. Um, our statutory reporting date, I think, for um, declaring our accounts is the end of November. So we're, we're two months past that. Um, are we now into a, uh, oh, there's a second point I'll come to in a minute, but are we now into a cycle where our audits are always going to be late? So are we going to catch up next year? That's, that's my first question. The second question is, 
but actually this also has an impact on our corporate governance in terms of our ability to do our internal audit on time because the pressure of now completing our audit at the end of January means that the work that we need for the internal audit team, because you've got your resource looking at external audit rather than internal audit, Mike, means that half of that's going to slip, whether we, we will actually be able to do all the work that we intend in terms of internal audit. So actually, we're in a bit of a mess here. Um, and I don't know whether, you, whether, whether there's a resolution. Yep, thanks for those brief comments. Um, I, yeah, on the latter point, um, seeing as it's fresh in my mind, that was something I was discussing with Lisa next to me um, this morning as a follow-up to a scoping discussion we'd had about the core financial controls review, which Internal Audit undertakes every year in order for Peter, who's on the line here, to give his Head of Internal Audit's annual opinion. So we recognise that we need to obviously prioritise both audits, um, they both have to be done, um, and what we're trying to work out between Lisa and myself is how we can um, make sure that she has sufficient time from my officers to be able to supply the information that she needs in order to do the field work, um, and that has slipped much much beyond where we would normally aim to um, undertake CFD core financial controls audit, so we're probably looking at January by the time we start that, and that puts my team under a lot of pressure because that is peak budget time of year. Then we have um, potentially interim external audit, but we absolutely do have to prepare for the 22, 23 year end, and that, that takes a good six weeks normally <laughs> detailed preparation. So yes, it will, put, it will put additional pressure on our work. What we're trying to work out is some mitigation. So we're, we're looking in, in detail at the scope of the internal audit, because um, as uh, members of this committee will hopefully recall, we've had significant assurance of opinion over the last um, two or three years at least. So there's no major concerns. All the recommendations raised have been low, low risk. So we're looking at descoping certain areas potentially where we feel that we've got more than enough confidence without prejudicing the opinion that Peter will need to give. Um, and we're going to make that um, as risk-based and inten um, intensive on those higher risk areas where internally we feel they need to um, focus as well as ourselves. Um, we've also discussed whether there's any possibility, for instance, um, taking on board Hassan's point about testing, whether internal audit could potentially review um, the work that's been undertaken by external audit um, and place any form of reliance or otherwise on the testing they've already done so there's no duplication of work. So we'll, we'll see where we get to. That's obviously a matter for Lisa and Peter dis to discuss between themselves and then with Hassan and his team. Um, the, I think it's, it's worth noting um, that uh, as far as the external world is con concerned, um, for, from my team's point of view, the audit for us effectively started on the 4th of July and barring a couple of weeks due to um, our key members of staff absence, we're now well into like the fourth month of audit, which is a long time for us to um, take team out of uh, business as usual to service it. So from our point of view, even though I recognise the comments that Hassan's made about try the higher materiality and the amount of testing that's required, it still is embroiling a large proportion of my team in fielding those queries and the last count, um, based on e um, the requests that come through EY's portal, we've dealt with over 200 individual requests through that portal, and at least half again via emails. So it's a significantly intensive period of work for us to undertake. Your, final, your, your first point was about the cycle, the vicious cycle we could get into, and um, I, would, I would probably say... Um, Yes, it's going to take a lot of work to get out of that cycle because, um, firstly, we were uh, maybe only, um, possibly the only local government client that Hassan had that had their account signed by the 30th of November last year, and he can correct me if he thinks he's wrong. Um, there are a number of other local government um, accounts for previous years that still need to be signed off. So it is going to take an awful lot of work between um, the auditors and ourselves to try and get that back on track. So we're disappointed that we won't be able to make the 30th of November, 
uh, but we'll do absolutely everything we can to support Hatton and his team to provide as much information as we can so that the opinion um, and the work that he has done can be reported back to yourselves at the January committee and we can get the account signed off as soon as possible after the statutory deadline. Well, two, two things that arise from, from that and um, Mike, I'll start with the first one because it's fairly obvious. If we are going to be paying 250% more for our uh, audit fees, then the least we should demand is that we get things done timely, provided we are not part of the problem. So if you can solve your own resource issues so that you can free information up and respond to questions on, on time, then I think you know auditors have, if they're going to charge an amount of money, they've got no excuse for not doing it on time. Although we always have that old chestnut about the fact that we've got to get the pension pension valuation, which takes us into a different avenue. But but that aside, my second point is, and this this came out of the pre meeting this morning that we, we had with with, with Lisa. Um, you've got to get an audit opinion from her, an internal audit opinion. And if we shunt her into a position whereby, you know, she can't complete what she needs to complete to do that, we've got a problem. So are you going to be able to prioritise so that you feel that you can get an audit opinion from, uh, from Lisa and her team? So, yeah, was what we were discussing uh, this morning, which was to effectively kickstart some of the field work almost as soon as Lisa is ready. So um, Lisa has kindly offered to put some of her personal time into this, this audit rather than delay things till January. So we can deal with some of the, the initial queries, get that moving. Then as soon as we've got capacity within the team, um, after the bulk of the external audit queries have been dealt with, we'll start to package up um, sections of um, the internal audit that Lisa can then run with subject to her own or other commitments. So I think we can we can manage that. I absolutely will make sure because it is essential for, for Peter and the likes of his opinion. So I don't want to hold that up in any way at all. My, my only concern is making sure that there aren't any nasty surprises coming out for at the end of the external audit field work that might require more, more time. But that's an unknown unknown at this stage. So we'll manage what we can do and that's make sure that Lisa gets all the information she needs to make sure we can box the internal audit off in time. Following on from that, um, you, you've talked about the you know, demands placed on you by the external audit, the amount of work you need to do for internal audit. We're going to come on to talk about some of the government's issues and things that need doing, some of the risk management issues that need doing. You've got the merger of um, with SIPT as well, that's why PTE. That all feels like it needs you know, quite a lot of, of officer input to support. It's not really one for you, but it's one more for the Chief Exec or, or, or Gareth. Are we happy that we, we're putting enough? I know no one ever wants to spend money on anything that's not seen as a frontline service, but are we happy that we've got enough people to do all these key things in, in the background, or are we reviewing to make sure we've got enough? And are we prepared to up the resourcing levels if we need to? Would you like me to answer that question initially, David? Um, so, as you might be aware, we're undertaking a review of the MCA. Um, which will look at resources as we move forward um, and um, in structural terms um, that will include each of the teams. So what that need may be at this point in time, I don't know, um, but I will be discussing that with Gareth in due course. Gareth, do you want to pick up? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, my understanding is some of the longer term structure of things, but Rightfully, I think several people have flagged immediate resource pressures, um, not least driven by events, but also by the imperative of um, delivering the integration of SIPTI and the MCA um, in April, fingers crossed. So Mike and myself review the budget every quarter, and as part of the budget um, review exercise, we test resourcing plans and we engage with uh, budget holders to, to make sure that they can feed through their requirements to us. So that process is underway. And that represents our second review of the year. And Mike and myself just had a conversation just this very morning um, about um, resourcing within the, the finance team. And the, the, the good news is that we retain a, a really prudent reserve strategy that allows us to flex um, our budget should we need to call off on uh, capacity resource for one-offs such as this. 
So I'm, I'm fairly confident that we, we can flex the organization's resource to meet capacity pressures wherever they are required or when they are required um, and to, to meet any short-term surges that we need to get over deadlines. But in the longer term, as, as the chief has said, there is an organizational review underway that will test more generally whether we've got the right resource and mix for the, the burden that um, of activity that this organization will deliver into the future. If I can ask the layperson's question, um, pricing for quality, does that mean if we don't pay that money, we don't get quality? It's a, it's a, it's a term which we, which we use to reflect the uh, increase um, work that's required to meet, uh, meet, meet regulatory d demands. I can assure you in terms of the work that we undertake, it's uh, in accordance with uh, quality standards. I've just uh, recently been subject to a quality review and uh, I was kind of pleased that uh, met the, you know, kind of we were scored in the highest category in terms of one of my engagements. So it's um, in terms of the work that we undertake, I can assure the committee that we do undertake the work in line with quality requirements and looking to ensure that uh, all uh, regulatory standards are met. no choice but uh, it does rather puzzle me I have to say we get an initial price and then we get a price for doing it properly. If I could just clarify for the committee um, the officers dispute the pricing for quality is presented within this document um, we we respect Hassan and EY's um, right to, to request that um, but the PSAA as the contract holder are the arbitrating body on this, so that it will be taken forward by PSA. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a time scale for that, Darren? When they come back to you? No, unless Mike knows different. Um, to, to be perfectly frank with the, the new independent member, uh, PSA's track record on uh, timely responses is not that fabulous. So I wouldn't like to commit to a date on their behalf. Right, Hassan, next appendix, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. So the the next uh, report on the uh, agenda is the plan for the, uh, the for the audit of the PTE. So I won't uh, take you through uh, this one in um, in uh, any detail because, as you'll see, it uh, follows a similar uh, format to the. Um, combined authority uh, plan, so I'll just go straight to asking whether members of the committee have any questions in respect of the uh, plan for the uh, PTE audit. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, really? It's, 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 it's not, not for Hassan, it's just something that went through my mind. I mean, presumably we haven't got the PTE wound up yet. We haven't been, so with all the turmoil that's going on in government, I mean, is there a date or are we going to have to go another year when we're going to have to order the PTE because it is still the statutory body? Uh, no, we've had the, the we've had the confirmation from the timeline from the department. Everything's progressing um, as planned. They've got all the information they need for us, so there's nothing to suggest at all that it won't go through the statutory process this year. Um, I think that's thank you to Hassan. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. And moving on to item 13, strengthening corporate governance rules. Thank you, Chair. So, so further to, I suppose, the matter arising that uh, Rhys uh, uh, made is that the normal report you get is uh, the governance improvement plan. Uh, but uh, what we've done this time, or what Claire's done this time and asked me to present on her behalf, uh, is the update on the wider review following the integration 
in uh, organisation structural terms, albeit the legal process is still to run, of the PTU and the MCA. We clearly had uh, different, slightly different governance systems, slightly different processes. And so a root and branch uh, review this year is looking at uh, corporate governance and forms of corporate governance uh, that we've got. And uh, the first thing to say is, is the, the, the threshold or the benchmark we're using in discussion with Lisa is to sort of make sure that this review looks at the three lines of governance. So are our controls and our policies fit for purpose? Is the senior management oversight sufficient? And then what is the, the terms of reference in the, the review of committees and working groups that um, the Audit and Standards Committee and the MCA will take? So we're looking at that sort of typology to do this review. A few of things to, to bring to your attention are uh, the Chief Exec asked that there is a formal Corporate Assurance Board established in the organisation. Now that's not to suggest in any way that the management board that meets uh, weekly, uh, which has all the sort of senior executives and other members of uh, the organisation, uh, don't do this, but, but clearly for transparency purposes, the Corporate Assurance Board and as an addition and a very focus for um, looking at all aspects of governance of the organisation is being put in place and that is meeting in the next few weeks uh, and we'll start to shape this work and look at the forms of assurance and, and where, they, where they go. So that's one of the uh, additions that, that we're making to sort of strengthen that second line of defence, which is executive governance. We've started uh, something that Angela frequently asked for, uh, a, a detailed bit of assurance mapping and those sources of assurance at every level. And I think that ties in as well to uh, Reese's comment about the terms of reference about what, what comes to this board and what do you expect to see here? What confidence can you get that the Corporate Assurance Board are looking at? And, and then the normal controls. So trying to work through this assurance mapping. And section 2.3 sort of sets out the initial governance areas that we're focused on, of which there's 11. Uh, and they're uh, to do with a range of, of governance, things that you might expect. So um, health and safety being one of them. Uh, human resources, information governance, information technology procurement, uh, uh, standards, uh, transparency, and then things like business continuity, asset management, and uh, accessibility. So they're the areas that we're assurance mapping against that three tier, what goes where uh, and when. And the sort of framework for doing that governance review is What's the regulatory framework that we have to adhere to? What's the organisation policy framework? And clearly, as I say, with integration, there was some difference with policies between the PTE and ourselves. So what, what is the sort of uh, core single organisation standard? Where are the assurance sources we've got? How does that inform internal audits actions in this to sort of uh, strengthen the uh, assurance uh, you uh, have? What needs to feed into governance improvement plan? What needs to then uh, feed into the risk profile and the new sort of risks that we, we test, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a really detailed bit of work that's running alongside um, the, the monitoring of this year's governance improvement plan. And, and I think the, the Corporate Assurance Board will probably, um, as, it, as it moves through that work, take the opportunity to either recommend changes to that governance improvement plan if things need strengthening as the, as the year uh, uh, goes goes on. Uh, so, so that's a, an update of this. I think probably it's worth saying uh, mainly um, to acknowledge uh, Reese's point that the decision was made yesterday by the MCA about the tram operations in the future and, and about the subsidiary. And, one of the, the bits, again, that the Chief Exec started through the management board is to uh, really um, take a, a, a piece of work from one of the specialist teams on where are the high risk, where are the safety, what is the organisation's role in terms of governance and manage that, which I know you, you, you've sort of said. So there's a, there's a range of things going on, but, but that's a piece of work that's, that's being done and underway, and, and Claire can feed that into regular reports to sort of give you uh, that comfort that, that we're, we're strengthening to the assurance uh, framework scheme. Yeah, 
mean, that, that, that last point is, uh, I, I think, obviously sort of key in, in terms of focus of the committee because this is going to be a big risk area, taking that on. So it would be good to have those those updates in terms of that that, that portion of work that's needed uh, through. Change report summary again. So, I uh, this was something that the, the National Audit Office published a detailed report giving advice to uh, audit committees on how they might like to hold public bodies to account for actions relating to the climate uh, uh, crisis and net zero. Uh, I think we circulated that report to members and I think the consensus was it was a very impenetrable report uh, given the, the size and complexity of it and we were asked to bring something back to help the committee I suppose distill what that report was about but also potentially to, to give advice to members on where they might like to act to seek uh, assurance uh, and I think it's fair to say you know, uh, uh, this is an area that probably is underdeveloped a little bit in the um, authority and the review that the chief executive spoke about is certainly looking at, uh, uh, along with the, the priorities of the new mayor, how does this become, and our, our commitment to net zero, become a stronger policy area uh, and, and with a clearer delivery plan. So the report that we've pulled together hopefully tries to distill what was an incredibly long and complex report uh, for members. Part one uh, of the report identifies the risk face uh, in the climate change and it gives some examples uh, of the public uh, sector risks and these uh, Claire's tried to summarise for you in Appendix A to this report. Now the first part of this it talks about uh, the, the physical physical acute risks, uh, such as uh, risks associated with adverse climate. Uh, and again, we can bring back at a future meeting, we have taken some steps in programme terms, in terms of flood mitigation uh, programmes to sort of show where we are addressing some, some of those risks. It then talks that there's transitional risk. So if, if the regulatory framework, uh, either driven by national government changes, and, and that poses increased burdens on um, the businesses in a particular area. There might be some uh, loss of uh, deliverable. So if, if I bring that to life a little bit, uh, whilst businesses in South Yorkshire were shielded from some of the worst effects of the pandemic because it hit heavily uh, hospitalities and sectors where we have a lower representation, uh, where climate and where the energy hike will affect South Yorkshire is we have a higher percentage of energy intensive industries and so changes in any regulatory framework uh, or, or action in there could uh, for an economic uh, or organization such as the MCA see some issues arising out of that which could be uh, productivity losses in some businesses it could mean some businesses with energy inflation and energy prices closing because of that and we we know that that's a higher risk for South Yorkshire and our policy team are monitoring that. So the transitional risks that the NAO report said, well, there perhaps are some KPIs that public bodies ought to think about. How does uh, what's going on in the, the sort of policy environment affect your ability to deliver an economic plan? And so that, that is one also that is a, a, something that is quite relevant to us as an organisation. But the, the third part of that section of the report gives some sort of quite clear guidance to uh, audit committees for public bodies. And it says you ought to be testing policy leadership in this agenda, value for money uh, uh, leadership, accountability and coordination and delivery. And those four areas in many ways are quite a useful summary for both our overview and scrutiny committee and our audit committee to sort of frame uh, the work that they want to do on um, holding uh, the MCA to account for its uh, climate and its, its net zero uh, obligations. 
So policy leadership, just to sort of uh, dwell on that, one of the things that the, the mayor has said in his manifesto is about a citizens' assembly and a real focus on climate. And, and I think the policy uh, framework uh, linked to having the new mayor will sh start to shape up. One of the first things that uh, took place, we had a um, uh, interim director of Net Zero. That post has been made uh, a substantive post, and we're working <coughs> through what this might mean. Uh, in terms of value for money, and and um, the the third part of the NEO report did speak about how do we test schemes and value for money. Government have put some more guidance out uh, linked to. Um, their orange book and their green book methodology, which uh, is a supplementary guidance on how authorities should test the impact of schemes and, dis and decisions they make on schemes against an environmental framework. And again, our, our policy and our assurance team are working through this supplementary guidance so that when we test our schemes, which we test schemes in line with the green book, that this extra consideration is being built in. And all of that comes uh, to fruition in our assurance framework that this committee sees every year and it goes to approval. So this next cycle will start to see some of that, that uh, framework coming in. Um, Appendix B of the report that um, uh, has been summarised for, for you tries to pick out of the report where um, government say there's some key lines of inquiry for committees and the second column of appendix b does this so as i say some of this is on governance and leadership some is about how does the organization uh, play its role in collaborating and partnerships and then there's quite a lot of detail on risk and continual improvement so there's, there's some information there in section 2.6 of the report, we try to think about what chunking this down uh, for members and what might you see in the immediate term as we start to get into you, uh, I suppose, holding the MCA to greater accountability on this. So internal audit kicked off a report, an internal report on how the authority is doing on net zero. That report's been concluded. Uh, it's not on the agenda today. There is a, a meeting with internal audit and uh, management to go through some points of clarity scheduled. So at the, your next committee, you will see an internal audit report on uh, where we are up to in terms of net zero. And the, the initial draft, while there's some <coughs> clarification and there's the sort of normal uh, management internal audit discussion to have, you know, it does highlight that uh, as, a, as an area against those four areas that the report said, policy and leadership, uh, value for money, some of that accountability, there, there will be recommendations that, that you as a committee will get a sense of where we are uh, ex uh, validated by the auditor and you might want to, to look at that and, and monitor those, those areas. The assurance framework that you see, we update the assurance framework, it is our document that government and because we're a devolved area, uh, we have to update that annually. That says how we're making decisions, how we test value for money, how we give that assurance back to government. Because we're a devolved area, that assurance framework in draft goes to four departments who all sign it off. DFT, DFE, because of the devolution of adult education budget, uh, Treasury and BAES. Uh, and then if they're satisfied with it, the MCA approve that. That comes to this committee in January. And as I say, the policy and assurance team are using the supplementary guidance that government have put out on how um, public bodies should factor in their environmental and greater environmental considerations into decision making. And they're working through that so that you should see that feature in the assurance framework draft that's presented to you in January. One of the things that um, probably um, in the, the coming months we try to run a development program for both the overview and scrutiny members and audit members and one of the things probably needs a little bit uh, longer to, to construct that perhaps with the uh, program director for net zero as, as some of the review goes through to understand that policy framework and where the, the direction is. One of the things that struck me in the first draft of the internal audit report that uh, I read it said 
you're doing lots of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily hang together as a whole. So you've got the flooding mitigation schemes, or uh, you've got the low carbon bus scheme. And when you start to look at it, there's investment going in, but how this is pulled together in a unified vision is probably not as transparent. And so it is one of those things that could be scheduled for your next year to have that workshop as part of your regular cycle of workshop to do that. And the last thing to give you some assurance uh, uh, as well, which is uh, something uh, the Net Zero Project Director has uh, uh, got the approval and is uh, mobilising a major plan of carbon literacy for offices in the MCA, and that is uh, early in November that will be a pilot, which is quite an intensive programme that across the disciplines of the uh, authority, uh, whether you're in governance, business operations, assets, policy, data, or delivery teams, uh, and at the highest level of the organisation uh, with executives, uh, there is an expectation that offices will go on that carbon literacy programme to start to um, uh, uh, I suppose give assurance that it is in people's uh, uh, way they go about doing their job that they understand the implications of this so hopefully I know know this was something that you said how do we how do we interface with this report hopefully that's uh, met your requirement from last time but if not we can take away further actions that's a very full report thank you very much I think it's an extremely important report as well yeah. uh, and that it's been taken so seriously is, is, is reassuring uh, we live, of course, in, as you mentioned, in, in a previously high energy producing, pollution producing area, and um, I think we have a, a, a responsibility to future generations to, to look at that. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions and comments on that. I, I agree. I think, I think that's a, a, that's a very very good report. It's a, it's a great starting test. It almost sort of uh, scares me in the sense of the the, 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 the the width of the scope that we're going to have to look at. You know, the, the, the committee could be sitting here for hours <laughs> look, looking at all of that. Okay. The two things that come to mind, Ruth, is there anything in here which you need to set timelines for um, once, you, once you've got in, into the detail and, and, and you, you've looked at it so that you can set timelines of things that have to be done because there are statutory elements for example that you already have to bring in like you know where we are with vehicles that have to be there in 2030 and the same for buses and things like that so you've got some statutory timelines that, that, that you'll have to try and hit um, and the other thing is that whilst it is uh, the NAO has produced a report which is which is national does it have enough detail to to deal with local demographics because you're, you're in an area of the country which gives you differences to other areas of the country, and therefore things that you have to be specific on, that you have to look a bit wider than the NEO report, if you, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I do. I think that's really the, the, the interesting bit about us, us doing a little bit more work on the kind of policy framework for this, because uh, you're right, you know, if you just take the bit about the, um, uh, the, the companies, you know, and our exposure... Uh, to high energy, you know, we may be uh, certainly Yorkshire and Humber as well, with lots of uh, lots of fossil fuel powered stations. Yorkshire and Humber always used to say, "We are going to struggle more than other parts of the country because the the makeup of our energy production and what we use makes it slightly different." So I absolutely do agree. Uh, there's nuance in. There's some other um, data and, and metrics that we, we need in a policy area when we try to capture some of this in the corporate plan. And this is, again, where it, it, it probably does need unpicking about how do we inform more modal shift? So our net zero program director would say, absolutely great that you can invest in net carbon buses, low carbon, low emission buses, fabulous. The biggest saving and the biggest impact will come will be on shifting from car use to public transport, regardless of whether the bus is a net carb or a low emission bus or not. So again, uh, data such as um, travel patterns and where, where some of the, the, the um, key performance indicators for our region ought to be, I think is where some of the nuance can come and that's where it gives that uh, platform for scrutiny to know what the scrutinising on an audit to know 
where are the significant um, policy objectives that we should be uh, assessing you against. And I think that's a little bit that I think the internal audit report will pull out that have we got that as clear as it should be in terms of doing that aspect of, of policy and leadership. Just note that um, Austin and I were at, uh, at a forum, the Yorkshire and the Humber forum, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, there might be an item, the hopefuls might be coming up on this very subject. And perhaps we can steal you to give that report to that forum. It would be very, very useful. So, thank you. And moving on, it's you again. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce this, but I am going to, to very quickly bring Liz in to do some of the, the, the detail on this. So I'll just kick the first very first section off and then I'm going to, to hand over to Liz. So uh, this, this report, as well as risk monitoring, I think the first thing is that um, you're aware, uh, you've had lots of sessions on we, with integration, use Liz to build us a new risk framework and we've done an incredible amount of work in the organisation on this including um, sort of re-procuring the risk management system which uh, is the four risk system that the PTE used to use but it's been significantly updated by the developers. The timeline in the first section of this report and I do have to say when, apologies when I read this report and I'll make it clear there's two sections 2.2 in this report that I spotted uh, so apologies for that. But the 2.1 uh, has got a timeline of where we said we'd be. And uh, uh, you can see in that that we are very much on track with the exception of uh, a couple of areas. Uh, and the first one uh, was the commencement of the additional resource that we said we'd do. Uh, that's been delayed because of the review that uh, the mayor and the chief exec are undertaking, but we've mitigated that line. Uh, uh, Liz uh, coming back to give an awful lot of continuity because we absolutely don't want to lose any momentum on the work uh, that we've done on risk. Uh, there is also um, a, a, a delay in some of the induction modules. I, I probably would have been uh, a, a lot uh, less harsh than Claire has been in putting these red because the amount of work that has gone on with teams on um, understanding their risks and moving those risks to the system and why we're doing things that we're doing is a is almost a one-to-one -one style of induction uh, so so I, I think probably it looks quite bleak that we've not done any uh, development work with teams and there's been quite a lot going on but it is still the plan that we will do quite a lot of detailed modules videos and whatever so when people come into the organization this is part of the walk and weft of how they are trained and developed uh, and there's also been an awful lot of work going on to get the directorate level reviews of risk sorted to move them to the system so you can have the reports uh, uh, coming off now. So, so that, that's where we are in the timeline, but I'm going to hand over to Liz to take you through the detail of, because uh, uh, since she's been back, she's been in and out of that um, four risk system trying to pull the reports <laughs> yeah. off, so knows it far better than I do. Thank you, Ruth. And I am still learning on the new four risk system. It is somewhat different to the previous version. Um, just, just to add to what Ruth's already said, in terms of agreeing the framework, as you know, the framework came to this meeting. Um, it went to the MCA board in July, um, where it was considered and agreed again. In terms of some of those other development um, activities in order to implement the framework, um, publication has also taken place onto the intranet and there are learning materials on the intranet for all the MCA's people to, to view, read, to learn and to familiarise themselves with both the framework and the system itself. Um, 
as Ruth said, the corporate risks, which are the risks that you have in the pack today as Appendix A, they've been migrated from the test system onto the new live system. Um, and all the team risks which we developed previously have been input. There's a small number that just need a spot of additional work and cleansing, but the majority of the risks are in. So there's been a tremendous effort, both whilst I was here and whilst I've been away over the summer period, where Claire and the team have been working tirelessly to put all the risks within the system and to purchase the system in the first instance. We do still have quite a bit of work to do, and that's to carry out some of the analysis on that business plan and team level risks, um, and also to take forward some of the reporting aspects of the framework, and that's through a management uh, reporting hierarchy, which you would expect in a, a risk management system. Um, in terms of the report that you have in front of you today, you, it's very similar to the report you had in June in that it presents an update against the implementation. It also provides a graphical representation to take forward Reese's requests on dashboards. Um, and that presents the corporate risks in different ways to give you uh, different insights and to demonstrate where the high uh, medium high and medium and low risks reside within the business. Just to pick up very briefly on those high and medium high corporate risks, um, as said there in Appendix A, uh, three of those relate to transport, uh, one of those to, tr to climate change. The committee has had obviously papers in discussion today on both of those areas. Um, a further risk is around cyber threats uh, that are the organisation's subject to, um, which is probably what a committee such as this would expect to see on a corporate risk register. Um, and the final uh, high, medium high risk relates to performance against the adult education budget and the targets, the associated targets. And I think Lisa was doing some work on that uh, prior to me. Uh, moving out for the summer. What you also have in your pack is a system generated heat map, which is different to what <coughs> you have seen before. Uh, the heat map has been drawn out of the system and it, the lines within it, it's Appendix B, look a bit confusing or I find them some, but the lines, the lines are there to show the movement from the inherent level of risk to the residual level. So if, if you could pop that into your minds before you look at it, I think that makes it a bit clearer. Um, as we take forward the further implementation of the framework, um, the intention is that this committee will see high and medium high risks that have been generated in the business. So then you can start to see a bit more detail. Um, in the reporting. So what this ultimately means is the committee will no longer see the medium level and the low level risks. <coughs> That's not to say they don't exist anymore, it's just we've taken them out of the reporting for this committee. And that the intention is that will give the committee the ability to focus on those things that really matter, as in the high and the medium high risks. And furthermore, that will take forward an action uh, in Lisa's last uh, interim audit report on risk management and that's as much as I'm going to say and hand over to you to ask any questions, comment. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for that report Liz. Um, I'll just carry on talking over, over, over the feedback and hope it stops. Um, <clears throat> just looking down the, the list of risks, I couldn't see much on the surprised that the merger with the PTE doesn't play a bit more strongly on it and that seems to be something that's exercising a lot of minds and feels quite risky at the moment and, and wasn't particularly in. Um, more minor one, you're de-escalating the borrowing risk and interest rate risk which 
might have felt a very sensible decision three months ago, but with the chaos in the markets and 15 changes of, of Chancellor Exchequer in the last three minutes, um, well, I just wonder if we you need to think about that. And, and the supplementary to that, does the rise in interest rates give you any opportunity to look at using some of these cash balances to, to reshed your, which I know something that has been looked at, but has never made sense financially, but as things change, might, might do. Uh, and the final question was just picking up on something you said. You, you talked about um, not taking the thoughts of low and medium risk here. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favour of the committee not being um, weighty with, with too much stuff. Is that the, well, two bits, is that the inherent risk or the residual risk? And, and secondly, if it's the um, residual risk level, it does mean that we, if I sit and think of the risks, there might be some that I just don't see because they're actually mitigated down which might lead me to saying, you know, what about the risk of so and so? I mean, in fact, it's not been reported because it's there, but you're, you're happy you've controlled it. I just wonder if if it's the inherent risks, and we're still seeing all the high inherents and seeing how you mitigate them, fine. If it's residuals, I wonder if we're just as a committee going to lose a little bit of oversight of um, the completeness of risks. So it might be one to think about. If I could um, just pick up on a couple of those points, Dave. Um, the risk noted around um, borrowing was largely to, to cover off the fact that this authority has, has not taken any borrowing for a decade or more. And it was leading us into activity that we were concerned we might not have the skill sets to, to, properly, um, to properly manage and mitigate. The authority doesn't have any borrowing plans in the immediate term, nor in the medium term. So our, risk, our exposure to interest rates in that sense is, is, is limited. And as you say, we do have opportunities around cash balances. So we've actually done quite a bit of work um, to mitigate the risk, which is, is why there's a, a small change here. And that was around upskilling existing team members, making sure that we have access to appropriate financial advice, resetting some of the relationships with, with Sheffield, who, who look after some of our uh, treasury activity. So we're fairly confident that we've taken the right steps to, to mitigate that risk, but it wasn't necessarily about the interest rate exposure itself. Um, and because we don't have any borrowing plans in the near our medium term, we can largely weather that particular storm, which I'm, I'm sure authorities across the patch are, are struggling with at the moment. On DSA, I think it, it, it's probably a fair point to say that DSA occupies an awful lot of officer time at the moment and is, is politically incredibly sensitive. And there is a, a really quite significant risk to the, to the regional economy associated with the loss of aviation um, in Doncaster and for the region more generally. But what it doesn't do is give us an immediate organisational risk in, in terms of the operations of the organisation nor the, the financial health of the organisation in the same way that something like the bus services may do. So I think that's probably one that we, we need to take away and, and consider whether it does need to go on and how we retort to that particular risk. Yeah. I'm just going to say on the DSA issue, I mean, uh, one thing that in a previous organisation we had was sort of an issues log because in some ways there's not a lot we can do to mitigate the risk of DSA because it's an issue that we're dealing with and therefore trying to think how we construct it on a risk register with mitigation would be um, tricky but whether there are some and whether it would be helpful if there are some big areas that are, are, are issues that you would like to see you know like that 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 you know, that we could learn from or what, you know, and that could inform the risk register maybe is one that we have to consider. Yeah, I think it will certainly be a responsibility to the official in the way of those things um, and uh, they're responsible when they are addressed. I mean, I've, I've been on this committee now for a few years. I go back when I first came on, the, um, <coughs> the whole process of, of, of looking at risk then compared to now and what we've seen here. So, I mean, it's, it's a transformation, isn't it, when, when, when you just look at it. And it shows the power of visual management, because I'm a great fan of visual management. So you're looking at something which is there in colour schemes, in 
bar charts and Gantt charts, you can get an instant, instantaneous sort of reflection of, of where you need to, to focus it. And I, I, I particularly like uh, on Appendix B, where you've got, I think, page is it 7072 or something, um, the, the chart, is that page 151? which has got the categories and tells you exactly where your risks are to focus. That, 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 that's a sort of excellent um, chart to enable you where, where to go to. So I, I, I think in terms of pulling this together, this, 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 is, this is really coming together now. I mean, there's still a, a couple of other things, and I know you're working on it. Um, something which tells us any risks that haven't got mitigations, which we need to know about. And also to help David's point in terms of trends. So if we can see something in terms of trends, so we know whether the minor risks are becoming major risks, etc. And th those are probably the only two things that are, that are, that are moving now. That, that one thing that did come to mind, though, is because risks are intertwined between categories, um, I, did, I did feel that in terms of, I think it's uh, page 180 or something, the finance risks are coming out as as relatively low by comparison to others. Because I think you're showing the high red risks in transport that are actually financially related. And we know that the finance risks are very high in relation to transport. So I don't know how you can how you can separate those out or, or, or get your mind around it, but it is a, it is a key point. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've done within the new framework and within the system, Reese, is to um, allocate what I'll call a flag to a risk. So that flag will cover things like finance, um, it might cover things like supply chain, it might cover broad, uh, multiple themes that we will apply to an individual risk. And what that then gives us the ability to do is, it's more complex than this, but to press a button and get a report on each of those themes. And that will then allow us to furnish Gareth, for example, with any risks across the whole organisation that have a financial slant to it, and thereby uh, increasing the insight and, and the value of the risk management system. Thank you very much. Next item 16 is Lisa Fleet and Travel. Audit. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can move us to page 156 of the pack and just pull out the key messages in terms of where we are with progress against the plan. So we've completed and published two final reports since the last committee. I will take those separately after this report. Um, but we have also completed the grant certification work for the year, so that's now complete as well against the plan. We've completed some additional work in terms of some specific grant testing in respect of the local growth fund. That report is with officers for discussion and will be published very soon. And as as uh, spoke about by Ruth, we have also completed our net zero work. So that report once we've discussed it and agreed the management response will also be published so in terms of where we are that equates to approximately sort of 33 percent of completion which ordinarily at this point in the year wouldn't be unusual because we do tend to complete quite a lot of the work within quarter three quarter four of the year but I do think it's important to raise now there are risks around delivery um, specifically in terms of our own internal audit contract, which comes to an end at the end of March. So we don't have the facility to roll forward any audit reviews past the end of March. We do need to complete and ensure we're in a position to be able to report our head of internal audit opinion uh, by that time. So we've spoken about some of the risks that are affecting that delivery. We spoke about core financial controls and ensuring we work pretty closely with Mike and his team to make sure that we can prioritise that work to ensure that we are able to complete that. Um, some of the other risks, just to highlight, are some of the 
reviews where we've agreed to push back or, or hold off on field work where there may be um, risks around or issues around capacity within the authority. So we've held back on the integration piece because we know that within the team there have been some capacity issues. Um, we've also held back on the adult education budget because there were some of the conversations in the background about an additional piece of work. Um, so, so there are legitimate reasons why we have postponed some of the work, but it is now just to highlight those risks of us having certainly capacity within our own team to be able to then deliver those pieces of work that are, are backing up into quarters three and quarter four. Um, so again, we'll work very closely with officers. We do have meetings in diaries to, to get these pieces of work scoped, to get them started, but I think it's important to to raise with the committee that there is risks around our delivery. So, so before I pick up on individual reports, I'll, I'll stop there to answer any questions. Thanks for that. Obviously, there's, there's risks around delivery, but what we, I suppose we need to know is how those risks are being mitigated, because ultimately, otherwise there's a risk that you won't be able to give your head of internal opinion. Like, like you were in the report and, and thought, Looks like they're making decent progress, but I hadn't realised when I read it that you know you had a hard cutoff date of 31st of March. Now, several questions: what what mitigation would be to say, right, well, it's a hard cutoff date, but you you still perform work in Q1 next year as as usual. Otherwise, you're going to have to prioritise down. In which case, the question is, how do you prioritise down, and, and and where do, where does that leave you? And I suppose a much more minor point: if you're going to drop work out of the programme, doesn't mean we get a rebate. But much more minor than the, 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 the worrying lack of assurance we might get from um, not having all the work done. Thank you. I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of those points, and I think it's absolutely right. And as Mike discussed earlier, what we have done is work quite low, uh, quite closely in looking at where the risk lies, certainly within core financial control. So, for example, we wouldn't always cover all systems every year. We'd look at it on a cyclical basis, but also look at the areas of greater risk for the authority. So, for example, we are focusing this year on where there may have been changes to processes and procedures. So, for example, where banking arrangements have been brought back in-house, we've seen that as a, a risk to ensure that there's proper processes in place, making sure roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. Looking at where other work may have been undertaken for example, um, detailed testing by the external audit team to see if there's any areas where we can lessen our risk assessment because other work has been carried out. And also in terms of where we've looked at processes in the past that have provided a significant assurance, whether we can place reliance on those in terms of not including those within our risk assessments again this year. So, so we've pulled together certain core financial controls, a programme that gives us us as an internal audit service enough assurance to be able to provide that opinion at the year end. Um, in terms of the other pieces of work and looking at priorities, we've, we've considered the priorities of those pieces of work. So the risk-based work around, for example, adult education and integration, we do still see those as a high risk to the authority. So while we may be able to agree a lesser scope, I think it's still important, given the risk to the authority, that we do still include coverage and provide assurance in those areas. So we wouldn't look to deprioritise or not provide coverage in those areas. We will still look to do those pieces of work. And within our own team, we are looking at opportunities to bring in additional staff so that we have got the resource in place to be able to, to provide those pieces of work. But it's, again, it, it's a risk, but we're doing everything we can and we are working very closely with the authority to make sure that we can provide that timely head of insurance, head of audit in, internal audit opinion. And while, quite rightly so, while we say the end of March is a dead cut off, in an ideal world, yes, that is the case. If there is roll forward, obviously, that's the discussion that we will have, but, but we are confident we will still be in a position to give that opinion. Because ultimately that's what you've contracted with us to do, isn't it? It's not our fault that you've decided to move out of the market. I mean, you've, you've got you know, obligations to do, do the work that we, you've contracted to do and we're paying for. Continue with that, Lisa. Chair, just to, to say two things to back up. Um, just to remind the members, you may recall that there's a number of days allocated in the prior year 
and from this year, which we used to do a review of community transport operations. That report can't be complete. It's taken some time for completion. Um, it's due for internal review in the coming weeks. And again, we'd welcome views from members as to whether or not they'd like to see the output of that in due course. Yes, in due course, absolutely. Yeah. Lisa. Thank you. So just moving on to the two final reports that we have published. The first is the corporate uh, governance review that formed part of our head board opinion for 21-22. That's now complete, so that's here for information. It gave a significant assurance opinion um, and just highlighted a couple of minor improvement areas which we have um, considered, but, but also just highlighting that some of the themes that are coming out of our reports are based on the integration of the authorities. So we are looking closely now as we come to the end of the year about progress with integration and whether that's having an impact on the work and the outcomes of our uh, audit recommendations. So while in isolation, perhaps we can still give significant assurance to a specific area as we come to our audit opinion for this year, we will look at the la wider picture to see if these themes are still coming through individual reports and we'll work closely with the authority to to consider whether we still think that's a risk or a bigger risk than what is showing in individual reports as we come to the end of the year. So with the GDPR piece of work, again, we we're able to give significant assurance because there are processes and procedures in place. It's acknowledging that, again, because of integration, there is work to do to still bring for example, the Information Asset Register together as a joint um, sort of documentation. But again, it's looking at the progress that's being made in doing that. So because there are processes in place, documentation in place, we've given it significant assurance with the caveat that we recognise there are pieces of work still to be done in pulling that, pulling that together. So again, I'm happy to take any questions on those two, two reports. Yeah, just one quickie from me. Um, yeah, thanks very much for these two reports. Um, is there is a link and has anyone looked at the SIP from financial management code that, that came in from 2122, which links to the sort of governance one? It might be a question for officers and SRE rather than the general. Um, yeah, good question, Dave. Um, I think it was the in the annual governance statement for. Um, 2021 um, accounts that I added for the code to come in. We've done an assessment for the back end of financial year 2021 um, against the code, because I think there's about 17 standards from memory within that code. So I went through and did a self assessment to see how we benchmarked against it and where there were gaps. There weren't many gaps, to be, to be frank, um, because a lot of the stuff that stays in the standards are things that we actually require by law to do. So for example, the prudential code, having an MTFS set in a budget, we have to do it anyway, so we tick those boxes. Um, excuse me. So I'm gradually on a rolling programme working through with the team. The, the main thing I have wanted to do, Dave, because it doesn't really get much airtime, and thanks for mentioning it, is that this code actually exists. And so one of, one of the things I've been trying to do during the course of 21, 22, 22, 23 is actually raise the profile, starting with my own team, and then as part of the, um, the financial service offer, which is all about putting business partners out there into the business devolving budgets, is to roll the code out with an improved non-finance um, service areas knowledge around the code and what it means for them. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, just briefly, I think the report is, is quite self-explanatory. There are seven um, internal audit actions that do remain overdue. Three are medium risk. Uh, the majority of those do relate to the review, which we carried out in respect of supplier resilience. Um, we do have a bespoke follow-up of supplier resilience within the audit plan for quarter four, so we will be looking at those actions and providing a report to the committee on the process, uh, on the progress at that point in time, but happy to take any questions. Yeah. Um, very, very quickly, I mean, in the supply resilience, there looks to be an awful lot to do by January next year. Is that, does that look a reasonable deadline still? Does that need a, a thought? And if we can't make it, what do we do to cover it? 
so um, the supply resilience that I just read to refresh commits and memory um, arose following concerns during the pandemic that we weren't quite sure what our exposure was to, to key suppliers. So we understood what we needed to do to support our customers and communities during the pandemic, but we weren't sure on the financial resilience um, or the logistical resilience of, of some of the key suppliers who help us to keep moving. Um, so we we asked the internal audits to come in and test um, some of our processes. Though that was a really useful report that gave us food for thought. And as part of the restructure that we undertook last financial year, we committed to standing up a new function within the authority uh, that would undertake this activity. As part of the organisational review that we touched upon earlier, we paused a number of um, the recruitment of a number of new posts into some of those roles. Whilst we we just um, we waited to understand how we take that forward. I'm pleased to say that, that those posts are now being recruited into. So um, we're following wind and some some quick recruitment. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to get that team staffed up and they'll be able to deliver that work. So it, it, it in, in some ways it's related. So, I mean, we are clearly now in a position where we're finding it difficult to close out recommendations on a timely basis, which means that the risk in relation to those recommendations is staying with us because we're not closing them out. Um, and I guess it's down to resources, Gareth, as, 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 as you've already said. Um, but clearly, if, if those continue, I don't know what impact that might have in terms of our audit opinion um, uh, going forward. Thank you, Reese. Yes, we do take into account, it's one of our considerations as part of the overall opinion timeliness of um, implementing actions, so it could have an adverse effect if they're not implemented when we do the follow-up review. Uh, item 20, Gareth. Yep, so the uh, contract procedurals um, require me to report to the committee on any breaches to, to those rules. Um, so that may, may be yeah, any malpractice that we, we identify throughout the, um, the activity since the last reporting date. Pleased to say that we, we don't have any breaches of the CPRs, um, but what the, the report does refer to is a suspected fraud um, on one of our major programs of activity. I'm limited in what I can say in public due to the ongoing investigation into this, but what I can say is that we've um, we've been in touch with internal audit as we're required to through our, our standard regulations, and we've commissioned a piece of work from Grant Thornton uh, to go in and undertake an investigation on our behalf. So I'll keep the committee updated on that. Item 21, Gareth again. Yeah, just an update on internal procurement. So as, as Lisa mentioned, we're into the final year of our engagement with Grant Thornton for um, internal audit provision. That contract ends in March of this year. We're where we need to be in terms of the re-procurement exercise. We previously shared the specification um, to members of the committee. We've not had any feedback on that. So we've um, undertaken to progress the exercise with our procurement team. Hopeful to get this resolved early uh, in the new calendar year where there's sufficient mobilization period for the, um, the new delivery agent to, to hit the ground running from April. So happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, I, I've got a couple. Um, is the committee going to have some involvement in that, Gareth? Because I think from the last, the last appointment, we, we weren't really engaged. But... Uh, I don't know whether there's any, I, I know statutory, from a statutory point of view, we don't, we don't have to be involved, except that we, we, we more or less inform us, but uh, are we going to get involved in the process at all? My second point is that with Christmas and New Year, have you got time within that period that you've got there for your evaluation? Uh, yeah, we, we do think we've tested this um, timeline several times with our procurement team and we're, we're quite comfortable with it. We were hoping the engagement with the committee would largely be around the specification that we're putting out to the market rather than on the evaluation exercise itself. The, the, the only reason I, I ask it is that in terms of value for money, um, which is something that, can, that the committee do, does have a remit for, 
I think we'd like to get some assurance that we're going to get the right value for money uh, from the appointment. And therefore, maybe there's some early engagement might help on that. Yeah, um, so the, the, the way in which the authority ensures value for money is largely through its financial regulations and its contract procedurals, which determine how we go to market and how we, we procure. So that we wouldn't expect to review on a case-by-case -case basis. If we're procuring per our, our CPRs that determine how we ensure value for money through the individual exercises, then that, that would be where I'd hope the committee gained assurance. Can I just go back a couple of steps and ask when the report on commercial transport might be available? Um, it's coming to an internal review uh, when I, within our operational management team week after next year. So as soon as that's been done, we can we'll bring it um, before the next meeting. Yeah. Claire James. Okay, so Claire's in. Claire's in the USA, so uh, it's not dialing in for your work plan <laughs> item, so I'm not quite sure how her name ended up on the agenda. Uh, this is your normal uh, work plan, which has got the core items on. I think it's probably worth um, going back to the point at the start about the terms of reference and the sort of real standard things you want to see that we perhaps have a look at this uh, outside this meeting just to absolutely uh, make sure that this has got the sort of right core uh, reports you get so we can uh, add into that um, but but this is your, your, your sort of standard report I, I just noticed that um, uh, it, it's saying you're getting the updated assurance and accountability framework in March which you do but but we always try to give you a little bit of early visibility of that in January and that's not on the forward work plan so there's probably a few amends to be made from that but if there's anything else that members feel important and then we can do that uh, action to sort of strengthen some of that in your, your terms of reference. Yeah, I'd already mentioned health and safety that's been missing from this report. I mean, it's from, from, the, from this uh, High function, but it's, but it's highlighted, <laughs> even though it's highlighted four times, as you say. So uh, presumably that's coming back next time, yeah. <laughs> Claire. Uh, Ruth Rowley. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for reminding me about the time. I was getting carried away there enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were always on time. It's no, it's no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay.